I say, aren't you President Kennedy? Uh, ex-president, I think. I, uh, seem to have been assassinated. How did you get here? Wherever here is. And who are you? And to return to my first question, where the hell are we? I'm C.S. Lewis. I just died too. And I'm pretty sure you're wrong about the location. This place just feels too good to be hell. On the other hand, I didn't see any god, did you? No. Then it can't be heaven either. I wonder whether we're stuck in limbo. Ugh. Do you really think so? Actually, I think it's more likely that it's purgatory. Especially if we end up getting out of it and into heaven. I did a bit of speculating about such places as a writer, especially in The Great Divorce. I don't suppose you've read it? No? Well, but uh, surely you should be familiar with such concepts if you were a Roman Catholic. Well, I was, uh, I was more of a, a modern Catholic. I never bothered about transcendental mysteries or mythology. I was too busy trying to take care of the world I lived in for escapist thinking. One world at a time, as Thoreau put it. You can see now that you were wrong, can't you? What do you mean? Why, first, that it isn't mythology. It's real. Wherever we are, here we are, large as life. And second, that the rule isn't one world at a time. Here we are in another world, talking about our past life on Earth. That's two worlds at a time, by my count. And while we were on Earth, we could think about this world, too. That's also two worlds at a time, isn't it? And finally, it's not escapism. In fact, not to have prepared for this journey while we were living on Earth would have been escapism. Don't you agree? Hmm. Well, I, I suppose you're right. Oh, hey, but, but look! Someone else is coming. Can, can, you, uh, can you make out who it is? Why, it's Huxley. How does Huxley? How does welcome? How did you get here? The same way you did, I'm sure. I just died. Oh, I say. Kennedy and Lewis. What good company to die in. Or live in. Or whatever we're doing. Where is this place, anyway? Well, that's uh, what we're trying to figure out. Lewis thinks it may be some sort of limbo or purgatory. I'm just hoping it's not hell. Well, you're both wrong. It's heaven. It must be heaven. Why do you say that? Because everywhere is heaven, if only you have enlightened eyes. Even hell? Oh, this is going to be fun. Lewis, you've lost none of your cantankerous penchant for Socratic questioning, have you? I remember you made Oxford a regular hornet's nest when you debated back on Earth, and now you've shipped your hornets to heaven. This is a nice challenge. Then reply to it. If everywhere is heaven, then either hell does not exist, or hell is part of heaven. Which way will you have it, Otis? All right, wait, 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 please. Before you two take off, could, could you give me some assurances about this sort of debate? Well, I was a, a debater too, but we politicians confined ourselves to the concrete and tangible. I'm not at all convinced you can do anything more than talk through your head about things you've never seen. So you want an assurance that there is some method of really finding the truth about things we can't see? Yes. Before you take off, be sure you have a plane that can fly, and one that can get back to Earth and land. Now, Lewis, you said you wrote a book about heaven and hell. Now, now how the hell, for how in, in heaven's name, how, how on Earth do you know anything about heaven and hell? H have you ever been there? Yes, indeed. I've been in and out of the back doors of both many times. You see, Mr. President... Oh, please, call me Jack. That will be rather confusing. My friends called me Jack. Suppose we let Rank have first choice. Would you mind if we called you Lewis? If you please. Clarity seems to be the thing here, not titles. Fine. Now, Jack, um, Lewis meant that remark about heaven and hell spiritually, not literally. Oh, well, if that's all you mean. Oh, no, 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 wait. Let's not get bogged down in the swamps of spiritual senses. Let's use words as literally as we can. I have not been in either heaven or hell, literally. 
Okay, fine. Then, uh, how can you possibly know anything about them? I've been told. What? What do you mean? Do you know anything at all about Tibet? Of course. Have you ever been there? No. Then how do you know anything about it? Oh, I see. Okay, I've been told, right? But that's knowing only if you believe what you've been told. Exactly. It's called faith. <laughs> so, so you just uh, you just passively, uncritically believe? No, I believe for good reason, and then I explore my belief with good reason. Well, I certainly don't want to impugn your faith, but I think my faith is quite different from yours. Hmm. How so? Well, you take everything in the Bible literally, don't you? Of course not. When Jesus says, I am the door, I don't look for a knob on him. And when he talks about heaven and hell, do you look for real angels and demons? Yes. Well, why? Why not interpret that poetically? Because the speaker didn't mean it poetically. How do you know that? When he talked about heaven and hell, do you think his hearers interpreted it poetically? No, they probably weren't sophisticated enough. Was Jesus a good teacher? Of course. And does a good teacher take into account his audience and how they are likely to interpret his words? Of course. And does a good teacher deliberately use poetic language when he knows his audience will misinterpret it and take it literally? Mm, no. You see what follows, then. He meant to be taken literally when he talked about the existence of heaven and hell. They're real places. Well, I find it a lot easier to believe in the goodness of man than in the badness of God. The badness of God? Yes. Can you imagine a worse god than one who claps human beings into hell for all eternity? Yes, I can imagine a much worse god than that. What god? One who would put people in hell who didn't deserve it. An unjust god. But the god I believe in is not only above injustice, he's also above justice. He's pure love. Ah, wonderful. Then there is no hell. That does not follow. Well, why not? How could pure love create hell? I don't think God creates hell. I think we do. Or perhaps evil spirits do. But God puts you there. No, again. We put ourselves there by free choice. Well, why would anyone do that? Who would prefer hell to heaven if it was up to our own free choice? Anyone who found God uncomfortable, unendurable. Anyone who couldn't stand the light, the truth. All right, so you mean it's not a matter of good deeds versus bad deeds, uh, a kind of uh, moral bookkeeping? No, indeed. Look at the thief on the cross. He made it to paradise, even though his life's red ink certainly outweighed the black. Well, I never thought of our destiny in other terms other than moral bookkeeping. And that's why you never believed in hell. Yeah, perhaps so. But I still don't understand how anyone could prefer hell to heaven. What do you think hell is, and what do you think heaven is? Well, as I just told you, I never gave it much thought. I suppose I, uh, I, I thought of them in the usual way, as rewards and punishments, pleasures and pains, bliss and misery. And you couldn't understand why anyone would freely prefer misery to bliss? Exactly. Suppose the bliss is not a reward tacked on to a good life, like a grade tacked on to a school course, but the good life itself and its consummation. And suppose the punishment is also not external and tacked on, but internal. The consummation of the evil itself. Do you see what follows? I think so. We choose heaven or hell in every choice of good or evil. Exactly. So that's what you mean by uh, having been in heaven and hell many times. Okay, but, okay, but now you're interpreting the biblical heaven and hell poetically, not literally. Instead of golden streets and fire and brimstone, instead of uh, physical rewards and punishments, your heaven and hell are spiritual states. I, I thought you insisted on interpreting heaven and hell literally. Their existence has to be taken literally, just as God's existence does. But their nature can only be grasped by symbols, just as God's nature can only be grasped by symbols. That sounds more like my modernism than your traditionalism. If you knew the writings of the saints and mystics, you would know that my interpretation is quite traditional. You modernists tend to dismiss tradition without much of a hearing for it, you know. 
Well, I'm uh, still not uh, convinced that an ordinary, sane human being could end up in hell. Read my friend Charles Williams' novel, Descent into Hell, and you will be. And where am I to find a bookstore in this place? Ah, touché. Score one for you. I do tend to get rather absent-minded at times. Well, to return to my original question, where are we? And why are we here, if this is neither heaven nor hell? Perhaps this is a second chance. I rather think it's the place and time to become clear about our first chance. What do you mean by that? What, what first chance? The choices we already made on Earth. I thought you said that this was purgatory. I do. What do you mean by purgatory? Oh, you do love your questions, don't you? He's Socrates reincarnated, Jack. Forget the compliment and answer the question, if you please. That is, if you really want to find out where we are and what we're supposed to be doing. You see, I'm not sure either, and I'm asking these questions to clarify my own ideas and find the truth, not just to win a debate with you or teach you something that I know and you don't. Aldous was right. You do sound like Socrates. All right, I'll try to answer your question. Uh, what, what do I mean by purgatory? Well, I never thought much about it, but uh, most Catholics believed it was a place where you had to go to suffer for your sins. What do you think? I suspect that idea is not wholly wrong, but not wholly right either. I think it's more likely that purgatory is a place for education rather than suffering. A sort of remedial reading of your earthly life. As such, it's really the first part of heaven, not a distinct place. So I think we are being prepared for a deep heaven if this is purgatory. I hope you're right. Why? Are you afraid we're in the other place? Frankly, uh, I'm not as bothered by the possibility of being in hell as I am by your belief in hell. I find the first quite remote, but the second quite present and threatening. Why do you find my belief in hell threatening? Why would that be the case if you don't find hell itself threatening? For the same reason you'd find belief in witches threatening, even if you didn't believe in witches. I see. Does it bother your mind or your emotions? What, what, what do you mean by that? I mean, are you bothered by my intellectual error or my motives for believing it? The, uh, the, the, the second. I thought so. How could a good and reasonable and kind man like you want to believe in a place of eternal torment? What are you, a closet sadist? If a mother shouts to her baby to run out of the street because a truck is coming, is she a sadist? Of course not. But she believes in the truck and the threat it poses. Well, yes, but she doesn't want it to threaten her baby. She doesn't make up a scary thing like that. Precisely. And we don't want hell to exist. We didn't make it up. Well, why do you believe it, then? It's a doctrine of faith. The Church has always taught it. The Bible teaches it. Jesus clearly taught it. So you accept this terrible thing on faith? Yes. Simply because you've been told? At first, yes. But then, investigating what I've been told, what we've been told, Jack, with my mind and my imagination, I find that it commends itself to my reason and invites exploration by my rational imagination. It's called faith seeking understanding.